Poetry Center bringing poetry to Patterson since 1980 at Passaic County Community College. Thank you everybody for coming. This uh, means a lot. We get such a good turnout on such a terrible day. Um, and let me first congratulate Edwin on winning the 2022 Boston <laughs> Arts Poetry Award. And all the, all the finalists, it was amazing work and we're really proud as the foundation to be featuring your work and um, honoring you here today. Um, I wanted to talk um, first a little bit about the Poetry Foundation, sort of how it came about. Um, when my mother was uh, in high, and by the way, I'm Laura's son, I think John may have mentioned that. Um, so when my mother was in hospice um, for about three months, we spent a lot of time together. And I have to recognize my wife, Kathy, who's here, and my daughter, Marley, um, who spent virtually every day. Marley was 16 at the time and made it a point to see my mother virtually every day. Um, and, you know, we're there throughout till the bitter end. Um, and they really helped sort of come up with this idea that we were trying to figure out how to honor my mother's legacy. And I have to say that um, before she was in hospice, I knew that she was a very good poet. I'd read her poems. I knew she was published, and she talked about her poetry. But I had no idea of her connections to the poetry world or her contributions. And it was only when I was there and I was monitoring her Facebook page and responding to her texts and her emails that I realized what an enormous contribution she had made to so many poets and so many people, particularly in the North Jersey community. Um, and we were talking about like how we could sort of preserve her legacy. And we came up with the idea of this foundation. Um, and at first she was like, oh, no, no, that's too much trouble. But over time she began, oh, that does sound pretty good. And uh, I'd really like to, uh, that sounds good, yeah, having an award with my name. And uh, she kind of, she definitely came around to liking it. She was definitely, um, in, in one respect, a very modest person, but in another respect, she very much enjoyed sort of being in the limelight and, and loved the idea of her name being carried forward. Um, and I, I should mention, you know, my, my mother was, I'm sure if any, any of you have read her poetry, you know, she was very irreverent, very honest, and um, the way Kathy, my wife, met my mother was back in 2000 at the January 1st um, poetry reading at CBGB's, which was quite a, yeah. you know, event in and of itself. But um, my mother read the poem, um, Of Course I Was a Virgin. And if any of you have read that poem, you know <laughs> it's on the explicit side. And, um, but it was incredibly well received with people like screaming out, what's the name of your book? Um, and that was Kathy's uh, initial exposure to my mother. And um, <laughs> it, it gave her a good sense of what the family was like. We'd always talked about, I always said, well, my family was stranger than hers. And she said, no, mine's stranger than yours. But then she conceded after that day. <laughs> I, was, I was the winner. Um, so we decided to start this foundation. And um, it's it's was really great in theory, but when it comes time to actually doing it, it was like a little bit more challenging. Um, and so I'm really grateful for all of the board members who have really made this possible and all of the people who have contributed. Um, it's a 501c3, so we, we welcome contributions to keep this going. Uh, and I want to introduce uh, each of the board members who were here first, uh, Maria Gillen, who I'm sure everybody here knows. 
Maria was such a great friend to my mother, obviously an incredibly renowned poet in her own right. But the thing about Maria over the years was whenever my mother would talk about doing anything, it was always with Maria. And um, whenever questions came up over the last couple of months, we talked about what, how do I do this? How do we do it? The answer was always, talk to Maria, she'll know. Talk to Maria, she'll know. And um, I, I know that she often, um, that she and Maria ran the uh, retreat at this convent, which she always talked about, it was a very important part of her life. And I always thought it was just so incredibly ironic that somebody so irreverent and sacrilegious <laughs> was doing this retreat at a convent. And I think if the nuns had ever known, like, or read any of her poetry, there would be no way they would be uh, allowed to have the event there. Um, also, Michelle Lerner. Um, Michelle is here somewhere. Ah, oh, here she is. Um, Michelle um, has an incredibly long connection with my mother, other than Maria and myself, uh, has known her longer than anybody, um, met her if I remember correctly, when she was about 16, and my mother came to teach or read poetry at uh, the school where Michelle was attending, and somehow they kind of clicked, and um, Michelle obviously had an interest in poetry, and my mother loved Michelle, and they became very close. My mother, I think, served a little bit as a mentor. Michelle was an intern um, for my mother, working on lips, and my mother would talk about, I only met Michelle recently, I think today's the first time I met her in person, but for years and years, my mother would talk about this wonderful poet who she'd taken under her wings and was doing all these great things, went to Harvard Law School, and was just this amazing person. Um, and I, I know that my mother just felt like this was the daughter that she never had. And um, Michelle was kind enough to agree to serve on the board. And Michelle's pretty much the person. If you write to the foundation, Michelle's the one who I, I'm very appreciative of is monitoring the email inbox and responding to your emails. Um, and so thank you. And she's an enormous help in, in running the foundation. Jim Gwynn. Um, also over here, Jim um, and my mother were incredibly close, um, working on Lips for many years. Um, I think Lips has now been in, uh, has been published for over 40 years, which I think is amazing in the poetry world for a magazine. It, it was something that was really important to my mother and something that we thought would make sense for the foundation to take over and to publish going forward. And the minute you talk about lips, my mother would say right away, make sure Jim Gwynn is going to be the editor. He's taking over. He's the person I trust with this. And pretty much, you know, that was her baby. And the fact that she trusted Jim um, to be the one to take it over really speaks so highly of him. And I have to say, Jim and Emily were incredible when after my mother passed away and coming over and helping us inventory the books if you'd i don't know if any of you had ever seen the inside of uh, her house <laughs> and the books um but it was really a mess and kathy and marley also were enormously helpful in that but jim and emily came over and really I, we couldn't have done it without them so thank you um ken ronkowitz um on the also a, a, a wonderful poet um, and has, uh, of all of us, the technological savvy to help keep the foundation going. I don't know where we would be without him because he runs the website. He gets out all the social media. Um, he's responsible for putting the program together today. And uh, also, he's the only one that reads the board's board minutes and actually comments on them. So I appreciate it for that and catches the typos. And finally, um, Jim Haba, um, who I'm sure most of you, if not all of you know, um, and Jim was uh, part of the, the Dodge Foundation and started the Dodge Festival. And 
one of the other things that I always knew every year in the beginning of the year was when the Dodge Festival was scheduled. Because my mother would tell me, I'm out this weekend. That's the Dodge Festival. I can't do anything. It was maybe the most important weekend of the year for her. And she was so proud to be a Dodge Fellow and to read at the festival. And so it's really meaningful that Jim would be part of the board and help us uh, c continue her legacy. Um, so as I mentioned, the foundation is publishing LIPS. We're going to keep that alive thanks to, to Jim's good work. Um, we have another issue that's about to come out. And the other major thing that we do is we sponsor the Narrative Poetry Award. It's a Narrative Poetry Award because if any of you read my mother's poetry, you knew that was what she liked to tell a story and be specific and not, she wasn't into creative, poetic license. It was more, she was telling something that came straight from her heart or her emotions. Um, and so that's the kind of poetry that we wanted to recognize and reward. And last year for 2022, we had less than 100 entries, but really great poets, obviously the ones in this room and, and many others, Maria judged, and she'll talk about that in a second. This year, um, the word has gotten out, we have over 200 entries, um, and so we're really happy to see that the award's getting out there, we've got entries from all over the country and all over the world, uh, and look forward to an award ceremony in 2024 to reward that winner. Finally, um, I want to thank New York Quarterly, um, which published Edwin's book. Um, Raymond, the publisher, agreed to, uh, in honor of my mother, to work with us to publish the book um, and make the copies as, as part of this process. And, you know, it's just an incredibly nice thing to do and very generous. So, that's pretty much what I wanted to cover. Again, thank you all for coming. It really means a lot that you would be here for this. And I'm going to turn it over to Maria to talk about the judging of the 2022 contest. Thank you. I hope this microphone is on. Is it? OK. Uh, before I talk about the contest, I just want to say a few things about Laura and how important she was to so many people. Uh, you can see it, please pick up a copy of the memorial booklet, which really has people writing about her and what she meant to them. And so many people from so many places wrote wonderful things about her. She was always so generous and giving to other writers uh, in the workshops that we taught together for, I think, 36 years. Um, she was always, she always finds something wonderful in every person's poem. Even if most of the poem wasn't so good, she'd find one wonderful thing and she'd point it out. It was a great quality and she was an amazing teacher, an amazing poet, an amazing reader of her own poems. Uh, she never laughed and they were often very funny, but she would do a deadpan uh, and, and the, that was such a wonderful thing to be able to do because she was able to put the poems across and she didn't giggle the way most of us do when we write about something that's embarrassing. She just read it straight and it made it doubly powerful. She could make you cry and laugh in the same poem and reading the same poem. I think her generosity of spirit to other writers was very important. I think the fact that she used her own money, even when and at the end of her life she was running out of money, um, she used her own money to uh, subsidize the magazine. And I'm so glad that uh, Barry and um, other people have contributed to try to keep Lips going. I think that's a wonderful tribute to her. And I love the fact that the award is going to continue from now on. I know Laura wanted to be remembered, and she was one of her big fears is that nobody would remember her, and nobody would remember her poems. And I think anybody who ever heard her read would have to remember her and remember her poems. Uh, if you go on her website, 
uh, www.lauraboss.com. There's a long biography of all the things she did, all the countries, most of which we visited together uh, to read our po poetry. And uh, I have to say, I'm going to Italy to do a workshop on the 9th, and I really miss Laura. I, I, I wish she were going with me, uh, and maybe she is in spirit. Anyway, this contest was a revelation to me, the number of really wonderful poems that are written. And what I found is that I had a lot of time, trouble picking a winner, because among the finalists and about 10 other people, I kept juggling and saying, OK, I don't know, I don't know, what should I do, what should I do? And then finally, I settled, settled on Ed Ramon's uh, book, Man at the Railing, and which is available out there for sale. And I hope you'll support him and support the press who made it possible to pu publish um, the book. Um, I want to read what I said about the book because all the finalist manuscripts were beautiful and moving in different ways. This was a very difficult choice to make. I finally selected, Ed, and I mean finally, selected Edwin's manuscript because the poems reminded me of Laura. After I chose the manuscript and found out who, whose manuscript it was, I felt I was right because I remembered that he is a poet whose work Laura loved and admired, and I felt that my choice would have made Laura very happy. I almost feel as though she guided me to that choice. As far as the finalists, they all write in the tradition that Laura loved, narrative poetry. Every one of them was moving, amazing. Uh, you're going to hear some really superb poetry today, and I'm really happy uh, now to bring Ed Ramon up to read from here, his award-winning book, Man at the Railing. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Um, Laura was a, a, a very important friend of mine, and um, I would be very grateful for this opportunity under any circumstances, but the fact that um, the book is uh, from the foundation named after Laura makes it all the more meaningful for me and I'm just so grateful and um, also want to thank, I don't think Raymond is here, but Raymond Hammond was the editor for me for the book and he was uh, probably the easiest person I have ever worked with. He was just wonderful. And so I'm going to read um, several poems from the book. The first one is called Champion. And it's about two qualities that I admire very much, sportsmanship and courage. And the setting is in the 1936 Olympics. And the 1936 Olympics were meant to be the big showcase for Adolf Hitler. It took place in Berlin. And this was, he considered this his chance to show the world how terrific Nazi Germany would be. And something happened at the Olympics. When I saw it on ESPN, I remember thinking, I want to write about this. And it involved two track stars. One was Jesse Owens, the American, and the other one was the German track star, Lutz Long. So this is a poem called Champion and dedicated to Lutz Long. I've seen in black and white how you were pure gold, losing the, the long jump to Jesse Owens, an American man whom Hitler called a non-human from the jungle. Where in that swastika-filled stadium did you find the courage to embrace the black athlete who had beaten you in front of your leader who had no room in his life for one so different from you, his fair-haired, blue-eyed model of his master race. I've seen the films of you losing, then walking the track with your arm around Jesse Owens and his arm around you, grinning 
like brothers, teaching Berlin and the world how one who loses can also be a champion. One can still tame hatred for an Olympic moment as Hitler stared from on high, looking stunned and alone like a demon homesick for hell. I was very grateful that I uh, was able to be part of the Geraldine Dodge Foundation Poets for uh, quite a few years, and one of our uh, responsibilities was working at the wonderful Dodge Poetry Festivals. This one, this poem takes place at the, the one and only time we held it at the Duke Farms in New Jersey in 2004. Uh, and all the poets who were working the festival, uh, including people like me who were uh, literally, you know, on the lower rung there working, uh, we all stayed at the Marriott in Somerset, and we took a shuttle over to the Duke Farms um, grounds. And this is a poem about something that happened on a Saturday night um, on Route 206. And this is dedicated to uh, an extraordinary poet who's now deceased named Philip Levine. And so this is called Kindness. There was just one seat left on the hotel van bringing us back to the poetry festival. And I was nervous when you, a nationally known poet, took that seat next to me an unnationally known poet <laughs> hired not to read my poems, but to help parking cars. What could you and I talk about for the 15 minute ride? But you grinned when you sat down, asked my name, and when I said I was a high school teacher, you joked, so Ed, what's it like teaching teenagers these days? and words between us flowed easily till suddenly the van braked in front of police lights flashing red around a deer that had just been hit by a car, alive but belly whopping in agony in the middle of the highway. The squad car turned sideways to block our view, then the loud gunshot that jolted me back in my seat. You okay, you asked, then put your hand upon my arm. One man caring about another man's pain. The first truth of being alive. I became a father for the first and only time at age 48. And when my son started kindergarten, I was 53, and they thought I was early for Grandparents' Day. Uh, this is a poem about when Liam was very little, um, maybe a year and a half. And um, we've all had those days where you think, eh, nothing's going on today. And uh, this is about one of those days and then how it changed. So this is called One Good Thing. It's been a dead parade of hours since 5 a.m., a march of the bland with the meaningless, and I can think of nothing I have done to merit mentioning or remembering. But now, at 8 p.m., I am bathing my son in a tub filled with bubbles and blue battleships. The soapy water over his Irish white skin makes him glisten like a glazed donut. And I should tell him, stop splashing, but this is the first time all day I have felt like living. So how can I scold my boy who's found joy in something ordinary as water? And when I wash his hair with Buzz Lightyear shampoo, 
Liam closes his eyes and smiles like a puppy being petted as I massage the sweet lotion into his red curls. And I know this is one good thing I've done with my life this day that has waited for this moment of water on my sleeve and soap on my nose to turn emptiness into ecstasy. <laughs> Uh, if you'll just indulge me a little bit for a background on this uh, next poem. I did my very first teaching, I taught for 32 years. I did my very first teaching in 1971 at a school in Racine, Wisconsin. And so in 1971, there were teachers there who had been teaching for over 40 years. And they, were te they had been teaching since the 1930s. Um, think about how schools changed from the 1930s uh, as, the, as the decades moved along. I always taught with a dress shirt, tie, and blazer, but I remember being called into a room by one of the oldest teachers, Harry. He called me in my first year and said, Edwin, when you teach, you should be wearing a white shirt. It was a very different and a uh, kind of atmosphere, and um, I would like to, to have that just as the, the foundation for this poem. This poem is called School Lockdown, Classroom Search in My 28th Year of Teaching. After Columbine, before Sandy Hook and Parkland, there was the morning my back door opened and two armed police led a German shepherd to the front of my classroom. The dog wore a badge and a warning, do not pet. Officers slowly walked him throughout my room so he could sniff purses and backpacks. Ice Silence suddenly replaced our discussion of Macbeth, a play where goodness decays to evil. When the dog reached my desk, he pointed his snout into my open briefcase and froze. The police told me, step away as they searched my folders, my pencil case, my brown bag lunch, and my pack of peppermint lifesavers. The officer then shut my briefcase and said, drugs, guns, we have to check everyone. You understand that, right, sir? I nodded, but grieved for 1971 my first year teaching. White-haired Mr. Delaney, our principal, his face blazing red at a teacher's meeting after he had found candy wrappers on the hallway floor and gum stuck in a boy's room faucet. What's this world coming to, he yelled. What's this world coming to? Two more. Um, my wife and I live in Pennsylvania uh, in a town called Wingap. And um, when I learned about what I'm going to read to you about, I thought I really would like to write about this because I was just so taken with it. Something that, that happens at uh, the, the town graveyard. And um, so I'll just. I'll leave it at that and, and read the poem. And this is called In a Pennsylvania Graveyard. When night covers this graveyard like a shroud and the moon is autumn silver, 
You sometimes see deer sleeping up against gravestones. Their long, delicate, yet muscular bodies lying like lovers with the eternally resting. Such strange, beautiful peace to see them pressed against chiseled names of the deceased. Some might have been hunters who spent November's tracking the very animals who now snuggle like family pets next to the engraved years of their lives. Maybe deer lie close and absolve these men for arrows and bullets aimed at their breed on fall forest mornings. Maybe bucks, does, and fawns understand, as we all should understand, the need to forgive and let go before sunrise calls us to continue our rapidly fleeting lives. And thank you very much for coming today. I'm looking forward so much to hearing uh, uh, the other five poets read from, from their work. And I uh, thought I would close with the title poem of this uh, collection. <clears throat> and it's after a photograph by Jane Tuckerman. Jane Tuckerman is a professional photographer. And I, I first saw this photograph on the cover of Tendril magazine, literary magazine. And this poem is called Man at the Railing. I want to meet this man at the boardwalk railing who looks out at the ocean rising like a roller coaster on its way home again and again to the shore. Maybe he could teach me about love in this world, why joy and loss join hands across our lifetime. Maybe he's found answers in the repetitious waves. Maybe he has something to tell me as we both look out at the sea. Thank you very much, everyone.